le webinaire d'aujourd'hui, quant à lui, était organisé avec l'implication active de la Commission océanographique intergouvernementale de l'UNESCO et la coopération du comité de liaison ONG UNESCO, que je remercie. Sans plus tarder, nous allons ouvrir notre webinaire et j'ai l'immense plaisir de donner la parole pour la première fois à M. Julien Pellot, directeur de la division des partenariats de l'UNESCO. Julien, tu as la parole. Merci beaucoup, merci Sabina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you all to this webinar, which as you know is about the ocean decade, catalyzing support and engagement. I would like to particularly welcome the representatives of our NGO partners and foundations in official relations with UNESCO, to whom I'm speaking for the first time, as you, as you said, Sabina. And I want to recognize the presence of many researchers, university, mar marine centers from all over the globe, members of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceano Oceanographic Commission Network. We're so pleased that so many of you are here today, joining us from all around the globe, from the Americas to Asia to the Pacific. In all the areas of our mandate, UNESCO is really fortunate to be able to count on your determination to work side by side with us. I have uh, recently joined uh, UNESCO, as, Sab as uh, Sabina mentioned, as the Director of the Division of Partnerships after more than 10 years at UN Women, and prior to that, I was at uh, UNFPA. And I've witnessed from these experiences the central role played by civil society in advancing our shared agendas, in pushing frontiers, in advocating for faster change. So I'm fully committed to upholding UNESCO's long tradition of partnering with civil society and further strengthening it and making it meaningful. Our midterm mid -term strategy provides a clear roadmap to do so. It places multi-stakeholder partnerships at the heart of the strategy and aims to harness our partners' comparative advantages and leverage both financial and non-financial resources for the strategic priorities of UNESCO. And that includes advocacy, expertise, grass level implementation, and many other areas. So we need to find ways to make this promise a reality in a world where unfortunately we increasingly see reduced funding, political headwinds and shrinking space for civil society participation. So you can count on us to be your supporter and your cheerleaders in this process. I already had some useful discussions with Mr. Davide Grosso, the chairperson of the NGO UNESCO Liaison Committee about this and with Sabina as well. And I look forward to engaging with many of you in the coming weeks and months. Euh, je vais passer au français. Euh, cette, euh, cette série de, de webinaires s'inscrit justement dans une volonté d'un engagement. Is, uh, founded on our desire to work with the civil society around a flagship initiative of UNESCO. And the objectives here are that all of us will be able to engage no matter what our skills are or our types of activities. Ocean's Decade is a typical example of a challenge that UNESCO cannot shoulder alone. And it's extremely important to mention that on today's first webinar. We need solid partnerships on regional, local, uh, international levels so that we can actually achieve our objectives for a more sustainable ocean. UNESCO is going to work with uh, different platforms. We hope that we will be able to uh, promote our platforms and our ideas internationally. It's also an opportunity for us to work with uh, other uh, NGOs, those who are already uh, at our side, working with the uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. So welcome to all. I hope that I myself am going to learn a lot, and I wish you all a very pleasant webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julien. I would now give the floor to Mr. Davide Grosso, who is uh, the chairman of the International Conference of NGOs and of the NGO UNESCO uh, Liaison Committee. Davide, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sabina. And thank you very much, uh, Julien, for that introduction and for having reminded us of uh, the strong ties that exist between uh, UNESCO and uh, the uh, ONGs. During this mandate, the NGO UNESCO Liaison Committee has put NGO engagement and empowerment as a top priority. That's because we firmly believe that the strength of a community is in its active members. And in this framework, we are putting in, places, uh, in place a series of action 
to empower NGOs and let them unlock the full potential of collective cooperation. You can then imagine how happy and enthusiastic I was when I heard about this idea of a series of webinars addressing major UNESCO programs and initiatives with the precise objective of a more concrete and efficient involvement from the NGO community. I've, I've also have to say that when UNESCO calls, NGOs are always ready to support and this occasion is not different. When we started discussing about the idea of this webinar, we decided to conduct a little research among NGOs in official partnership with UNESCO and ask them what they are, what, what are, what were their actions on this field. Thanks to this little exercise, we have learned about some excellent initiatives by uh, the International Association of Art, for example, or the Living Earth campaign by CCIDS, or uh, the local actions carried by the International Associ Association of Charities, and those carried by ECOMOS, which we eventually decided to invite today to make a presentation. The Ocean Decade is an enormous effort to elaborate concrete solutions for a more sustainable future and in the end to save our planet. Knowing, safeguarding and caring about oceans means knowing, safeguarding and caring about ourselves and the life on this planet. And the hundreds of very diverse but complementary actions that NGOs carry every day all around the globe contribute to these objectives. From scientific research to raising awareness campaigns, from increasing ocean literacy to monitoring uh, ecological resilience, each action counts. And I hope that the following presentations and discussions will inspire many of you uh, of, of doing similar things. We are all involved and we can all play our role and be part of the solution. Let me finish by thanking the Unit for Civil Society Partnership, Cher Julien, Cher uh, Sabina, for having started this process. Uh, let me thank you also the colleagues from the Intergovernmental Oceanic Oceanographic uh, Commission the colleagues uh, 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 from NGOs, Ocean Generation, Under the Pole, and ECOMOS for uh, being able to share uh, their experience. And uh, I have really to say that I'm looking forward for a fruitful uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Davide, pour ces remarques. Uh, thank you very much, Davide, for these comments. I'm absolutely certain that uh, our cooperation with the Liaison Committee is going to be but strengthened by this initiative. Thank you again to the committee for its uh, very uh, invaluable help. UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission was tasked with designing the decade and the leading is implementation and work with a wide variety of stakeholders, some of which are present today. As you will have noticed in the program, we will now show a two minute video on the decade, followed by a keynote presentation. Then three NGOs will share their experience relating to the ocean with a question and answer session scheduled at the end. I therefore invite my colleagues to display the video on the decade and wish you all a pleasant viewing. The next 10 years will be crucial for life on the planet as we know it. Climate change, food shortages, epidemics and disasters, economic crises and unemployment. The good news? We can rely on a powerful source of common solutions to overcome these challenges. Our one shared ocean. Set to become the world's seventh largest economy by 2030, our ocean regulates climate and provides food and livelihoods for over three billion people. But do we know all our ocean has to offer? Can we harness ocean solutions to achieve our global goals by 2030? The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development brings together scientists, governments, business, 
philanthropists and NGOs to unlock the science we need for the future we want. Are you ready to join the movement? Find out more www.oceandecade.org Dear partners, we will now get to the heart of the matter with the keynote presentation by Mrs. Mr. Julian Barbier from the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. Mr. Barbier is head of the Marine Policy and Regional Coordination Section, our in-house team in charge of the coordinating the UN Ocean Decade. Dear Julian, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Sabina and, and dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and thank you for choosing uh, the, the theme that you have picked today. The ocean indeed is uh, something that concerns all of us and sometimes uh, in ways that we, we don't even think about. Uh, and, and I will hopefully provide you through this presentation an overview of uh, the decade so that uh, hopefully by the end, even if you are not directly working in ocean affairs, you will find a way also to contribute for, uh, to, to, to this very important work that uh, UNESCO is leading through the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, but we are leading this on behalf of the UN system and, and all ocean stakeholders in a way. So let's move to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, and let me maybe highlight a little bit the reason for this specific ocean decade. I think the, the short video showed us very briefly that you know the, the ocean is critical, critical to our life support system in terms of the biodiversity, the carbon, the regulation of the climate and so on. But at the same time, marine ecosystems represent probably some of the most heavily exploited ecosystems throughout the world. If we just look at coastal zones, for example, those actually represent only 4% of the Earth totals land area and only 11% of the world oceans, yet they contain one third of the global population. And within those, we are catching 90% of our, of our fish. We've lost uh, ecosystems at tremendous rate, uh, whether we're talking about salt marshes, mangroves or coral reefs in the last decades. So the, the picture is a little bit gloomy, I have to say, uh, and reports after reports, we've, we are hearing this uh, from at the international level. But there is also good, political willingness to change uh, the way uh, we are moving forward. And one of this uh, framework is certainly the sustainable development goals that were uh, approved in 2015. And in particular that highlighted the ocean as one target and one specific goal that should be achieved. We also have uh, more ocean consideration in, in international fora, in, for example, in the ocean, in the UN uh, Climate Change uh, Convention framework, but also in the area of the Convention on Biological Diversity, where there are plans for protecting about 30% of the ocean space uh, in, uh, you know, by 2030. So this political willingness is very important, but at the same time, we also need science because all those processes, particularly when we are dealing with the ocean, are very science intensive. There's still a lot that we don't know about the ocean uh, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of interaction with, uh, with uh, climatic and atmospheric processes. And we are under investing in ocean research. Uh, a report that we published in 2020 highlight that governments are only putting about in average 2% of their uh, national research budget in ocean science when we think that the ocean represents 71% of the surface. So this is, this is uh, inadequate. So the decade really comes from the idea that we need a global plan. We need a global plan to address those major knowledge gaps. We need a plan to build capacities of stakeholders uh, at the international level. Not all countries are equal when it comes to their capacity to generate science, but also no, not all stakeholders are equal in, in using and generating uh, knowledge for, for action. And more importantly, we need to transform this knowledge and whether this is scientific knowledge or traditional knowledge into solutions to address those critical issues. We cannot just do come up with diagnostic. We need to move towards the solution area. And that really implies a change of doing business because if we want to deliver and, and, and have those solutions, this implies really working hand in hand with policymakers, with industry, with philanthropy and civil society to work in this collaborative and co-design way to ensure that the science actually turns into actions and not just reports. So this was our starting line uh, with a decade, and if we can move to the next slide, please, uh, which basically originated from the IOC. IOC, maybe you are not all aware, 
uh, what, it, what it stands for. It's the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. It sits within UNESCO. It has 150 member states, and it is the UN focal point for ocean knowledge uh, in, uh, you know, at the international level. And that really came from this uh, dichotomy that we saw that we have the SDGs, we have this political uh, framework for advancing uh, you know, decisions, but at the same time, we don't have a major science initiative to support those efforts. And this is when we developed this uh, first concept, which was first uh, developed through a, a, a two-year uh, process with many consultations around the world, regional workshops were organized in over uh, 11 ocean uh, basins, and bringing not just the scientists, but also bringing the civil society members the decision makers and, and industry to help us identify what were the issues that each uh, regions cared about. And this helped us to formalize the implementation plan of a decade, which is very much our roadmap. And that was presented to the UN General Assembly at the end of 2020 with the effective start of a decade on the 1st of January, 2021. So if we go to the next slide. So what I want to really share here is that you should see this ocean decade as an action framework, an action to really uh, deliver transformative ocean science solutions for sustainable development. And to do this, we need to have a, 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 an organized uh, structure to do it. And this is why we came up with a, a, you know, identifying 10 ocean decay challenges, and those were identified through those consultations. And those really represent the most immediate and pressing needs uh, that the decade should really address. Of course, those may evolve in time. This is also a flexible and adaptive framework, but this at least provide to the international community a, um, a target in a way of uh, you know, delivering uh, specific actions. So I just want to say a few words about those DK challenges. They are addressing specific knowledge and solutions area, whether we are talking with marine pollution, we're talking about solutions for protecting and restoring ecosystems, for increasing the capacity of the ocean to provide sustainable blue food, we need also to uh, provide uh, uh, solutions for the sustainable ocean economy and the ocean and climate nexus. At the same time, we also have three other uh, decay challenges that are also addressing the infrastructure uh, issue. That is, if we want to deliver solutions and knowledge uh, across those first five issues, we need to have appropriate ocean observations. And uh, IUC is leading the efforts in developing a global ocean observing system. We want early warning uh, disaster risk reduction mechanisms. And you know we also at IOC working on tsunamis, for example, this is one strong area where we can build from, but also having much stronger access to data. Ocean data is really the core for taking actions and delivering information where it, where it is needed. Uh, but the data is sitting in databases and we need to open this up so that uh, it's really available for, for the global science. And then the last two decay challenges are also very important. They are relating to our cap to capacity development, to the issue of ocean literacy and having basically stakeholders uh, having the capacity to, to generate and use knowledge to deliver action and eventually to ensure that we have a behavior change when it comes to our relationship with with the ocean so those 10 decay challenges are basically the you know the the way we we stimulate the uh the international community and 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 solicit uh, proposals for decade programs for decade projects and activities as well as contributions which are basically called for uh, uh, every six months where we organize uh, a call for decade actions and i'm going to say a few words about this if we can go to the next slide please Great, thank you. Uh, and then so you, you see that this first call for decade action, uh, which was launched actually uh, at the end of 2020, um, was basically opened to address those 10 decade challenges. And this actually generated a huge amount of interest. Uh, we received um, over 100 proposals, uh, which was a lot of work for the Secretariat because we had to really go through each of those proposals and, and really look at, uh, you know, making sure that those are also aligned with the criteria of a decade, because this is not a rubber stamping exercise here. We really want transformative actions and also ensuring that uh, you know, stakeholders are involved in the, the co-design approach. So this uh, led to those uh, programs on ocean observations, on predictions, on modeling, on mapping. Uh, so very kind of hardcore science issues. 
but also I would say less uh, hardcore. I just want to highlight, you know, we generated also a lot of interest from um, the community working on underwater cultural heritage. And I think one of our colleagues will, will highlight these issues, which is also very important to um, to highlight some of those other dimensions of the ocean in terms of cultural um, uh, assets and, and, and preservation. We also received a proposal for regional programs and cross-cutting programs. Uh, so those actually, uh, you know, were endorsed uh, at the beginning of 2021. And if we go to the next slide, um, and then the second call also generated um, a lot of interest. But the second call was a little bit different because we really started to get a global picture, and we wanted to use those calls to focus where we are gaps in our 10 decade challenges. And this is why we only picked three decade challenges for the second call. And that also, again, generated uh, several contributions from about 33 countries globally uh, and uh, resulted in the endorsement of four programs, uh, 83 projects and, and four global contributions. And then the next uh, slide, please, uh, which is basically the work that we are now doing, and this was um, also completed last uh, August, uh, and this particular call focused on the sustainable blue food challenges and the sustainable ocean economy, and we received also a large number of, uh, of proposals which are now under under uh, assessment. But I guess uh, what I want to say through this mechanism is that you know this this is could potentially be the largest global campaign for, for saving our ocean, for really increasing the, the, the knowledge and the uptake of that knowledge for ocean action. And in this uh, framework, we very see, we very much see the role of NGOs uh, as, as a really essential element of, um, of stakeholders. Uh, and I want to say maybe a few words about the way we are organizing uh, the decade. So you can see also some potential entry point for NGOs and also foundations to, to support this work. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is really how we are coordinating the decade. So we have a, a decade coordination unit, which is here based at IOC UNESCO in Paris, uh, but we also work in a very uh, decentralized way uh, and also you know, engage other organizations to help us with the implementation and the coordination of a decade. And this is what we call decade uh, collaborative centers and decade implementing partners, uh, which who have basically agreed to take on some responsibility in terms of stakeholder engagement, in terms of um, you know developing um, specific programs for uh, for the regions or a given theme. And we have endorsed in the last um, in the last few weeks. Uh, and that was actually in June, uh, we've endorsed now uh, seven uh, uh, decade uh, collaborative centers and decade implementing partners. And amongst those, we have NGOs. We have actually, um, I want to highlight one uh, NGO based in the US um, who is actually helping us to develop youth advisory council uh, on ocean matters in, in, in many countries. We also have another one uh, which is actually focusing on the ocean climate nexus and uh, providing a frame, a, a collaborative platform for co-design. So this is just hopefully a, the start of a list um, and uh, we would like to see very many more organizations that have uh, you know strong expertise that have a, a, a very clear mandate that can contribute to this work to come forward and to be a partner uh, with uh, with UNESCO in 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 the implementation of, uh, of of a decade if we now look at the national level and and please go to the next slide uh, because this is also very important the decade is not just a a, a top uh, down approach it's also bottom-up approach and for that we want very much to have a strong engagement at the national level one way to do this is through the establishment of national decade committees that bring together not only scientists but also policymakers, industry and uh and and private sector for example in civil society of course and those are really helping us to create a dialogue at the national level in terms of what are the priorities that the country needs, for example, to in terms of delivering specific scientific uh, science-based actions and 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 and, and basically, um, you know, provide a a, a way to develop uh, you know collaborative activities among stakeholders. So we hope to have many more uh, decade committees to to emerge, but certainly NGOs can play an important role in triggering uh, 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 you know those. Uh, 
decade committees. Certainly, we've seen this uh, happening in certain countries where actually it was NGOs that uh, was the trigger for establishing those uh, those countries, those national decade committees. There is also work being done at the regional level. Um, of course, when we talk about the ocean, we are also talking about ocean basins, and there are certainly a strong collaboration historically amongst nations around given uh, ocean basins. So we are leveraging leveraging this through a number of regional task forces that are uh, actually uh, you know multi-stakeholder in nature, but who are helping to identify decay priorities at the regional level. And of course, those are very much open. Uh, not uh, just to scientists and, uh, and and governments, but to to NGOs as well. So so, you know, don't don't hesitate to to reach out if you think you can make a contribution to uh, to to see how we can uh, plug you in in through those uh, through those discussions. If we go to the next uh, slide, uh, and um, I think this is also just to highlight some other areas of work that we are doing in the decade, uh, whether in the area of technology and innovation. Uh, in the areas of communication and uh, awareness raising, because of course the decade is also about uh, delivering, you know, uh, very strong communication messages and, and to number of target audience. And for that, we need some resources, we need some tools, and we need some skills because, uh, you know, scientists are not always the best. Um, to, to, to communicate and for that we need social scientists, we need expert communicators, we need media advisors uh, to really uh, pass on the message at, at all level. We're also working on data issue, I've mentioned that, uh, private sector, uh, we see the role of the private sector as a, as a very important force uh, in terms of building public-private partnership in ocean research, but also engaging them in, uh, you know, for example, making some data available for science. And then, of course, we have a decade expert rosters, which is a, a way to, to provide uh, access uh, and, and to, to engage uh, experts in supporting our process. If we go to the next slide, because I, I think we're running out of time, so I don't want to be too long. Um, just want to say a quick word on resource mobilization, because, of course, the decade is, is not so much a financing framework. Um, it's more of a matchmaking uh, framework by really understanding and, and bringing those actions together. And most of the time, those actions have some funding attached to them, but uh, they are also looking forward for additional support. And through this, uh, uh, you know, this this uh, enabling environment we are trying to build around the decade, we are also being able to connect uh, some of the needs with the provider of potential resources, whether they are at the national level. Uh, for example, we're working with some countries in aligning their research um, funding uh, calls uh, with the priorities of the decade, and we've done that in, in two or three countries now. We have set up a, uh, a foundation uh, dialogue, and I'll just say a quick word on this, uh, and also we are working with, uh, with, with industry. If we go to the next slide, just a, a quick word on the work um, with philanthropy uh, in the context of a decade. Uh, this is something that actually started straight from the from the start of the design of a decade about three years ago when we realized that more and more foundations were playing a key role in, in providing support in funding innovative and transformative science. So we created this group, which has now about 20 private um, corporate and family philanthropic foundations. And uh, we've had several meetings with them uh, just before the, the big UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. We had a, a big meeting in Morocco hosted by the Mohammed VI Foundation, uh, which really helped us to develop innovative mechanisms that can really help support, for example, the co-design of those actions. And, and hopefully in the next few months, we will be also releasing some of those um, uh, you know, innovative uh, funding uh, uh, structures uh, so that all of the decade stakeholders can use them and, 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 and basically come forward with proposals. Finally, my last uh, slide. Uh, so to try to recap a little bit on where we see from our side, uh, you know, the, the, the role and the engagement of uh, NGOs in the ocean decade and also uh, foundations. Certainly, uh, we have some examples already in our uh, in our work where we have NGOs that are leading or partnering in specific decade actions. So you can also uh, be the innovator and 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 provide propose specific actions. Many of those are led by NGOs. You can also lead or host some of those decentralized coordination structures where you have some capacity and resources available to help us, uh, you know. Uh, 
partly coordinate uh, the decade in, in your area of work. Uh, that, that's something that we are very much interested to explore. But also, you may have access to uh, specific networks of uh, individuals, of experts that can also, uh, you know, help with uh, with our uh, with, with our work and plug in into the work of of a decade. I think uh, you know some other important consideration is that we really see NGOs as a, also being strong advocate at the subnational and, and national level uh, on the importance of ocean science. Uh, building capacity development for ocean science as well, and particularly, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of initiatives on um, on citizen science that, that that are led by NGOs, and certainly we need to to connect those initiatives and 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 uh, you know uh, also share the best practices across uh, across the countries. We are certainly also looking for. Uh, additional support to increase engagement of small island developing states and least developing uh, countries and also focusing on uh, early career scientists and, and professionals we have a, for example a dedicated program on uh, on on those early career professionals uh, which uh, we know we would like to to have uh, uh, replicated in in all of the, the countries of the world so the benefits I think of engagement is that you are then becoming part of a collective and a global initiative um, you are accessing to international regional and national dialogue and uh, we are uh, you know in the context of a decade building a, a, a global network with diverse partners leading to co-design and co-delivery of transformative initiatives and hopefully this will also help with uh, access to new financing opportunities and, and stronger visibility and recognition so if you are interested to in either way uh, to, to, to join uh, us to work with us we are very much uh, happy to talk to you. We are a relatively small team here, but we, we try to, to follow through uh, each of uh, and, and nurture those interaction. Uh, and uh, just maybe if we move to the last slide. Uh, we very much uh, you know, would like to add some NGO logos and foundation logos to the uh, ever number. And to in the future, uh, the ocean we need for the future we want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. On behalf of all participants for your presentation, you, your presentation helps us better understand the objectives and the challenges of the decade. You mentioned transforming scientific knowledge into solution, connecting people and ocean. And you have given some leads on how our civil society participants can contribute. At the end, no matter the line of work, we all may play a role in it or further strengthen the current engagement. I have seen already some few questions in the Q&A. I just remind to all participants, uh, if you wish to ask questions or make comments, you may use the Q&A tool now and we will pick up them uh, later after the other presentation. Thank you again, Julian. We will now move on the second part of presentations and we'll be hearing directly from three NGOs about their experience on the ground, uh, working on very different aspects around oceans. They are Ocean Generation, which is a movement which seeks, which, which seeks to take tackle ocean threats through science and storytelling. Under the Pole, which is an underwater exploration program which combines scientific research, innovation and awareness for ocean knowledge and preservation. And the International Council of Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, which is uh, well known in uh, UNESCO community since it's a long-standing official part of UNESCO working in uh, conservation and protection of a cultural heritage. Uh, non coincidentally, all three of our speakers are, if I'm not wrong, experimented divers. Let's welcome them. Mrs. Joe Braxton from Ocean Generation, Emmanuel Perrier Bardou for Under the Pole, and Christopher Underwood for ICOMOS. The first presentation will be made by Joe Braxton, the founder and face of Ocean Generation. She previously worked for 12 years on the production of underwater wildlife films with the BBC, and now focuses on marine conservation, 
with productions such as the Netflix well-known documentary, A Plastic Ocean. Joe, I know that you wish to show us a video. If you agree, we launch the video and you will take the floor immediately after. Okay. So. Take a deep breath in. Now another. One of those breaths came from the ocean. Our ocean is the cradle of life. It is boundless in beauty and magnificent in power. It inspires us and fascinates us. It connects and feeds us and it breathes for our planet. But our ocean is threatened. Threatened by human progress. Threatened by carelessness. We suffocate it with pollution. We corrupt it with plastic. We exploit it through greed and industry. The ocean, our natural life support system, is failing. When the magnitude of damage is so overwhelming, it can be easy to look the other way. But this crisis needs a new voice, a new hope on the horizon. We are calling on a movement, global and inclusive, to work together and restore balance. Together, we will lead with science, build a new narrative around people, share untold stories through film. Together, we will challenge convention, establish ocean intelligence and free our ocean from human threats. As the first generation to understand ocean issues, we are the last generation who can stop them. We are the ocean generation. Joe, the floor is yours. Joe, we cannot see you. It is now time for you to take the floor. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, for some reason it disconnected just at the wrong time. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, are you gonna show the slideshow from there, please? Sabina, can you hear me? Can hear you, and I'm just waiting for our colleagues to show your okay, great. slides. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Ocean Generation is a registered charity in the UK. We were originally known as Plastic Oceans, and we were established because I was making the film A Plastic Ocean, and I wanted that film to have a legacy through education and through outreach. Um, you can show the next slide now. We rebranded to become Ocean Generation because when we started, nobody was talking about the problem of plastic, but now it's on so many agendas and more and more people are involved with it and understand what we need to do but there are so many other ocean issues that we wanted to tackle. Probably the one that affects us most of all that we can do something about is climate change. So um, on to the next slide, please. All of our materials are backed through peer review science. Sorry, one back, thank you. Um, we are working mainly with young people, but obviously as somebody who is not one of the young people, I'm very concerned that everybody is engaged with our work and what they can do about it. I think with so many problems that we hear about now, people start to feel overwhelmed and they can't think what to do, so they switch off. But what we're doing is showing that if everybody can just do a little bit, that's gonna be far more effective than a very, very small handful of people doing everything. So that's what we're about. Um, next slide, please. We have uh, developed our Ocean Academy, and this is um, aimed at uh, three different age groups. Next slide, please. The youngsters, the very young people, we have um, a, a, a game, an app. 
which is in a collaboration with Earth Cubs. And that really gets people thinking about the ocean and learning about things while they're having fun. Then the middle age group, the five to 16 year olds, this is um, more formal education that teachers can pick up and use straight away. And it saves them having to go through all that lesson preparation because it's all there for them. And finally, our wave makers for the older age groups, and it honestly doesn't stop at 25. We've had 60 year olds on this getting just as much from it. But it's when people are thinking about a career in sustainability, we'll help guide them through that with lots of programs and follow up with them. Um, but also if they have a chosen career, that's nothing to do with the environment. It's how to bring in an element of sustainability to their work and how to encourage their colleagues to do the same. And the next slide, please. And our, um, our, we, we started off by making our documentary, A Plastic Ocean, and in fact, uh, UNESCO was the patron for that film. We're now starting on another one, and we're just at the fundraising stage for that. And the new film is all about hope for the ocean. It's going to intrigue people. It's going to get people to fall in love with the ocean and learn things about it that they never knew because we protect what we love. And it's like reintroducing people to the ocean, why it's so important for us and, uh, and to, to engage and intrigue. And that's the, the purpose of the new film. It is, it is um, very much in line with the goals of the decade of ocean science. And, uh, and, and that's why we're keen to get it done as soon as possible. So we do, um, if you can just finish off with the last slide, please. Um, I just wanted to say how, how proud we are to be a partner for UNESCO in the Decade of Ocean Science. So thank you for choosing um, our NGO as one of the organizations that are speaking today. And we really look forward to seeing where this partnership might lead. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for your presentation and for the work your organization is doing since now a uh, long time. Um, we will now move to the next presentation and we will come back to your presentation during the Q&A session. It's a great pleasure for me now to give the floor to Emmanuel Perry Bardot, who is the uh, co uh, inspiration of uh, Under the Pole. This is a movement uh, uh, that uh, is uh, underwater exploration, which combines scientific research, innovation, and awareness for oceans, knowledge, and preservation. Um, so Emmanuel will also be showing us a video. We will start with a video, and then you will be able to take the floor straight after the video.
Manuel, c'est à vous. Emmanuel, please. Thank you very much. Under the Pole was born in 2010, and it stemmed from an idea that Guylaine and myself had after one single realization. Only 5% of the marine surface was actually known, and that was mainly between 0 and 30 meters deep. The mesophotic zone between 30 and 200 meters was unexplored. So limited by physiological constraints, uh, scientific uh, exploration has found its second wind today. And today we have uh, specialized divers, we have uh, all sorts of uh, ways to open up a better awareness of the ocean, things such as uh, um, fine and rapid uh, action that gives us a wonderful alternative to scientific trawling. Between 2019 and 2021, the Deep Hope program associated technical skills in navigation and in diving, deep diving, with Under the Pole and the CREOB CNRS science for the study of uh, mesophotic coral ecosystems and French Polynesia. This new model of cooperation transformed our vision of the ocean. It showed us so that the mesophotic zone was home to havens of biodiversity that were escaping the phenomena such as coral bleaching and that were seen that were acting as refuges faced with global warning. The coral diversity is even more important deep underwater than in the surface. Our conservation models show that there is a compartmentalization of awareness that does not take into account what happens in deeper waters, that is between 30 and 40 meters. Whereas the results of Deep Hope are alerting us to the need to study these deep ecosystems in their continuity from the surface to the depths in order to ensure the preservation of marine biodiversity. This inspiring approach is something that we are working, uh, working with today in a scientific program called Deep Life uh, that uh, is being led in cooperation with the CNRS and an international scientific consortium. This is recognized as a project uh, in the United Nations Decade for uh, Ocean Sciences and Sustainable Development. And Deep Life will range, will go from 2021 to 2030, will range from the poles to the tropic, will go through the more temperate zones. It will d go off to discover marine animal forests. Uh, in other words, animals that are capable of creating ecosystems that are very similar to forests, such as coral forests or bryo, uh, bryozoan forests or gorgonian sponges, for example. These have already been considered as vulnerable habitats by the UICN, and they are largely unknown uh, as to where they are to be found, what their ecology is, uh, uh, above all in the mesophotic zone. The first phase of our expedition has just uh, finished in Svalbard, and it's a little too early to talk to us to talk to you about that. But we can already say that we have discovered exceptional animal forests. This uh, phase of cooperation is uh, going to be the basis for a uh, report, but also to will be used for raising awareness. Uh, we work with schools for uh, about uh, 5,000 pupils a year, the great public and so forth. And we work with the Rectorate in Rennes, the Educational uh, Environmental Education in Brittany, amongst others. All of this is in line with the SDG goals 14, 4, 13, 9, 17 and 12. Global changes are affecting marine life degrading biodiversity, and this is a major danger for the balance of our planet. This summer, the Mediterranean reached a temperatures of between 26 and 28 degrees over long periods. Um, and this at depths of 20 meters, sometimes 30 meters. Divers have seen this. Our forests are burning and we are looking elsewhere. The next stages of our expedition will take us to the Canary Islands in a few days, then to the Caribbean. Um, underwater forests are awaiting us somewhere in the mesophotic zone. They are waiting for us because more than anything, their preservation depends on the decisions that we take. Under the pole is uh, working so that decisions will be enlightened by knowledge. Preserving biodiversity is also preserving ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for that presentation. And we'll come back to that later, without a doubt.
chairperson of ICOMOS International Committee on the Underwater Cultural Heritage, and he will, he will be telling us about ICOMOS work on heritage preservation and this connection with the oceans. Chris, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, next slide, please. Anyway, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, or wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, webinar. I and also my thanks to UNESCO for this for the invitation. I'm honoured to be here and be able to share with you some of the work of ICOMOS and the related partners of which we are related. Uh, those notably are the Ocean Decade for Heritage Network and also the accredited NGOs or partners to UNESCO uh, Convention 2001 Convention on the Protection of underwater cultural heritage. Next slide, please. Um, my previous speakers have shown some wonderful videos and wonderful um, images of things that were brought to our attention during the first meeting of the ocean decade, essentially, in uh, Copenhagen in 2019. And my personal reflections from leaving that um, meeting were quite shocking. And as has already been mentioned, the ocean is not too big to fail. It is out of sight and often out of mind. There are solutions. And I think at this point, it was a case of being inspired to take action. Cultural heritage was not necessarily seen, obviously, as a partner to the issues and the solutions to the decades ocean. Of course, we spend much time in it and observing it, but it's how to apply that knowledge in a broader capacity to the broader marine science community. And of course, the things that struck me, and I've already been mentioned, was the need for open access and data sharing, citizen science and ocean literacy. Next slide, please. Sort of stimulating interaction at this particular time, Ocean Decade Heritage Network created what became effectively Societal Goal 7. And I'll just pick out the keywords, again, which have been reflected in the videos and the images previously. Inspiring and engaging o ocean. And basically the aim is to build a significantly broader understanding of the economic, social and cultural values of the ocean by society and the plurality of roles that it plays to underpin, and that is super important, underpin the health, the well-being and sustainable development. This has formed the essentially the, the foundation for all our action and has catalyzed us to move forward. Next slide, please. Stepping back from this, how do we actually engage with the, let's say, stakeholders, but also the broader community? And what I'm showing here in, the, in this particular slide relates to outcome seven, inspiring ocean. We have to inspire the, the public and also important stakeholders who can actually do observation science or take actions. I've listed some, this is not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination, but recreational divers are working and diving in the ocean every day around the world. How do we harness their observations, their knowledge, their reflections? Maritime museums through ICMM are an obvious outlet and I hope that during the decade they will take up the challenge of promoting ocean science. Open access, I mentioned that open uh, earlier. Data sharing, very key to this. UNESCO accredited NGOs right now are committed to developing a toolkit to describe the importance of ocean literacy, to debunk some of the jargon and make it accessible to the wider public. And citizen science is a no better way of engaging directly with important stakeholder, which is the public. Next slide, please. Just as simple examples of how, let's say, the recreational sport diving community can get involved. These are existing uh, European-based projects and are also in parallel with other um, programs around the world. Creating marine litter cleanup projects and observational projects can include survey, monitor, report, share data. Again, the emphasis being on share data. The projects can be local, regional or international, and we know they are existing. And this is also helpful from a cultural heritage perspective, because as the next slide will show, 
each of our sites underwater are mini, uh, or you could say micro, ecosystems. And through pr a combination of recreational diver, the stakeholder, very important stakeholder, and ourselves as the profession, we can contribute to monitoring, observation, and critical data in terms of formational change to the seabed. And in fact, this, the slide on the right-hand side will be familiar with some of you. It's a multi beam data taken over subsequent years on one particular site, microscience. And you can see the blue represents depth of water, and you can see it getting shallower and shallower and shallower as there is change to that particular site. This is, can all be monitored and can be added to the big data project, which is seen as a public good in helping an existing the development of marine science, transformational science across disciplines, of which underwater archaeology is just one. Next slide, please. Also, as a result of the um, first meeting in Copenhagen in 2019, the Ocean Decade Heritage Network was formed by those people who were there in, in, in the meeting. As a result of the first program call, we now have our own dedicated cultural heritage framework program and a network of possibilities, decade project, decade activity, and decade contribution. And I'd like to think that what we're doing today is a decade contribution. I'm also able to say to tell you today that ODHN has been seeking funding and has been successful in receiving a significant grant from the Lloyd's Register, a London-based foundation, which will um, secure a secretariat for the foundation and the um, Ocean Decade for the next several years. And we hope subject to performance that will continue a decade. The official announcement will be made later this day by the cha our chairperson. And we see this as a major step forward in solidifying the progress we've made over the past two years in being able to cr critically have the funds to be able to move forward on an absolute 24-7 basis. I think I can speak for my community is we are inspired and I hope we can inspire the listener to take small actions, medium actions, large-scale actions and change the obvious threat to our, our wonderful oceans of which you know the previous speakers and myself see on a regular basis. Thank you for listening, and, and I think that's the last slide. Thank you, Chris, for your presentation. And your presentation brings us to the end of this section. Mesdames et Messieurs, nous avons écouté, je crois, trois présentations très... Ladies and gentlemen, we heard three very interesting presentations. And once again, I would like to thank our three speakers. Their presentations showed very different ways it is possible to get committed for the ocean from uh, advocacy initiatives to scientific exploration to uh, rethinking our link with the heritage uh, we have been able to think of the relationship between uh, the ocean and ourselves and uh, maybe it will give uh, new ideas to our partner NGOs to uh, keep developing, which leads me to our Q&A session. Let me continue in French. So most questions that we received, I think, illustrate uh, the fact that it's uh, necessary to get information from our partner NGOs. So at this stage, they're mostly addressed to our colleague uh, from the IOC. Many people are asking, how can we get committed? How can NGOs, whether they're partners or not, uh, can, how can they commit? Others are asking how to commit at a national level. So I think that's the common point in all the questions we received in the, the Q&A box.
uh, like um, knowing the uh, on, some people would like to have more information on the cooperation between uh, uh, the IOC and the IPCC because both structures are complementary. Many want to know who they can contact later. One of our partners will ask to uh, comment on the role of the Ocean City Network and mechanism for local cities to join the network. Uh, maybe, maybe Julian, you can answer, you can start yeah. to answer and then we'll, um, we'll come back again. Okay, sure, I can do that, uh, Sabina. Uh, so I think the first question is a very good one because it's very concrete and uh, really how, how do you how do you enter this process? And uh, for us, I think that the, the clear answer to that is the Global Stakeholder Forum of, of the Ocean Decade, uh, which is basically a virtual space that brings together all the active um, stakeholders of, uh, of the decade. In there, you will access this through the oceandecade.org website. Uh, and it will take you about three minutes to uh, to register. But then you will then see the whole uh, landscape of uh, and the diversity of discussions that are going on. What I did not mention in my presentation is that those actions that are getting endorsed, they are not just working individually and, and going on with their own plans and, and business. The idea of a decade is really to create synergies across those actions and create communities of practice uh, of stakeholders and action proponents to, that have common interest in cultural heritage, in education and uh, awareness, in uh, ocean and climate aspects, in ocean resilience, and so on. So I think uh, by uh, by entering this uh, stakeholder forum, you will then see uh, yourself what are the potential areas of interest that also uh, align with uh, the work of your organization. Uh, and then identify potential uh, people then that that can work with you and who can if you are planning for example to develop a decade action you might uh, find some partners uh, you might also find some experts and of course you will find all the information about the decade and we will publish for example the newsletter uh, we we will improve the newsletter. We inform about the call for decade actions and so on. So it's really the the main entry point to uh, to, to to really understand and and start connecting with uh, with other people. Um, I see there was a question related to uh, GIEC, so IPCC. Yes, of course, IOC uh, collaborates and and the decade in itself. I mean the. The, the knowledge that we are generating in the decade, and we have several programs that are addressing the ocean and climate nexus, uh, are generating uh, you know new observations, new knowledge, which of course you know needs to be used and feed some of those global uh, climate processes uh, and assessment processes, such as uh, GIEC. So IOC is a, is a is an observer, is an official observer to to the IPCC, and uh, certainly we do contribute. Uh, to to the to the annual uh, to the, the assessment review process of the IPCC, uh, two or three years ago there was a very important report that the IPCC produced on the state of the ocean and, and the cryosphere, and of course mm -hmm. we we also contributed to that. Uh, I think there was a question. Sorry, shall I carry on, or do you want to? Sorry, Julian, may I interrupt no. you yeah. just Go because ahead. I have just been informed that the chairperson of the liaison committee has to leave because he has okay. uh, another commitment. If you allow me, I will sure. give him the floor for a few words and then we'll come back to our discussion. Merci, uh, merci, merci Sabina. Et, uh, en fait, je, je vais Thank pas... you so much, Sabina. I don't want to take too much of your time because uh, the discussion that is going on is uh, fascinating, but I have to take a train. Apologies, I took so many notes in less than one hour, and I must say I'm impressed to see all the actions led by NGOs, as well as uh, the list of opportunities and needs that have been identified by our colleagues uh, at the um, IOC. Let me just sum up a couple of points. There is a message that we tend to forget. But as uh, the chairperson 
of the International Conference of NGOs and the Liaison Committee. That's something that I keep reiterating. The concept is that we are stronger together. And I am sure, looking at the list of questions, that it's a, a first step for better and more significant commitment from NGOs. And you don't have to be a scientific NGO to contribute. And I would like to call upon uh, NGOs and official partners and uh, let them know that the liaison committee is uh, there for them. And it should be a space for them to have access to more information so that we can build opportunities together. Thank you so much. And please continue this discussion. I hope you enjoy the, the time left. Thank you so much, Davide. coordination activities, the priorities for the Indian mm. region, region. So maybe up to you, Julian. Yes, uh, certainly we, there was a question, I think, regarding the, uh, you know, the existence of a, a, a task force in the Indian Ocean region. The answer is no, we don't yet have a, a, a regional task force for the Indian Ocean. But the good news is that uh, we will be announcing uh, very soon and uh, probably in the next few weeks, the establishment of a decade collaborative center based in India uh, to support the regional cooperation uh, uh, in, in the region. So certainly we we hope that, uh, you know, one of the first tasks of that regional center will be to set up this uh, task group. Uh, which of course would be open to, um, to 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 all nations, and uh, but also not just uh, you know governmental representatives, but also civil society uh, representatives. So we will certainly announce this uh, in in due time through through the um, through the decade uh, website, which again is also the, the main source of information if you want to find out about the call for decade actions. And I see there was a, a question there. Uh, about where do we find out information about the calls for actions. So again, this is a, the decade website. Just for your information, I, I mentioned we issue two calls per year and we try to make sure they fall on regular uh, and at, at the same date every year so that people are aware. So this is 15 of April and 15 of October, every six months, basically. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Julian. I don't see other questions, uh, specific questions. Some of them have been answered. Some others will probably have been addressed indirect, indirectly by Julian. Uh, I don't know if our speakers want to add something, uh, Chris, Joe, or Emmanuel. Uh, what I see, and if I may maybe say something, is that our NGO partners uh, uh, have a, uh, I mean, have many national branches. Many of them are international and are con constituted by national branches, national institutions, and they have a special capacity uh, to uh, to act at the grassroots level. So they have a role to play in this respect. And at the same time, through our collective mechanism, they have also a major role to play collectively. You mentioned, Julian, in your, um, in your uh, presentation, the creation of working group on the decade. And maybe this working group could be something that will be go beyond organizations that are specialized in ocean and uh, in marine science and go even farther to other NGOs that have capacities in uh, awareness raising, in, um, in advocacy and so on, in the social science. I think Chris mentioned the social scientist and so on. Um, uh, there is anyone that which take the floor before we close the webinar? Um, yes, Chris, the floor is um, yours. Serena, thank you very much. And it's just a reflection and a, perhaps an observation based over the last two years, since I suppose <clears throat> the uh, decade of ocean science really hit the floor and, and I can see that it's made amazing progress. I sometimes find, again, from a personal perspective, and I think ICOMOS and the partners I work with are quite closely connected, obviously with the 2001 convention, 
uh, which is the Underwater Culture Heritage Convention. But sometimes I find the, com the communication from like inter-UNESCO organizations related to the, the decade doesn't come through to us in a, in a let's say, a simplified bullet point this, uh, list. I hope that makes a bit of sense. So trying to improve the communication between us, and I, and I see that being both ways, not necessarily just from UNESCO to your partners, but also as partners, up to you. So maybe to, to try and improve that somehow. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Chris. Uh, je pense que nous allons peut-être uh, arrêter notre débat. Nous aurons I think that it's uh, time to close our debate now. We'll have the opportunity to continue our discussion in the future. I would like to give the floor to the Director of Partnerships for concluding comments. Uh, Julien, you have the floor. Thank you, Sabina. I saw that Joe was raising her hand. No more time. Sorry, it, it was just an observation um, because I started working in ocean conservation in 1990 and the oceans were always the last place to be considered. And even when I worked at the BBC, we were the first ones to do a full series about the ocean. I just wanted to say that seeing that this is now the UNESCO Decade of Ocean Science, how far we have actually come, it's quite easy to sort of concentrate on all the problems and, and all of the, the hurdles that we still have to overcome. But looking at the difference between 1990 and 2022, I really do see progress and I hope that that will accelerate. So thank you for letting Fair me point. just say that. Thank you. No, I totally agree. And actually, you know, I think that what I wanted to just reflect in, in these closing uh, remarks, I mean, I don't I don't I will not attempt to summarize, you know, the, the very rich uh, discussions and presentations. But uh, but what I find quite remarkable with this work is how it brings together, you know, very complex uh, scientific work with the more kind of general public uh, mobilization and uh, call to action for everybody to be able to do its part. And I think you have all spoken about that in different ways and in the work that your organization does in what we're trying to do at UNESCO as well, to create these connections between the different communities and to really try to work together to solve the problem and to try to improve um, our lives and the, the life of the planet. So I think it was very inspiring. I learned a lot. Uh, I, I actually, I'm one of those, Joe, who actually did not know much about the ocean and, and who is getting educated now here at, at UNESCO and the importance of this agenda and the, um, the, 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 the enormous amount of work that can be done, but that we can also do at, at an individual level is, is, is very interesting to discover. So we look forward from our side to continue to support uh, this work, the, the decade, of course, with our colleagues from the IOC uh, and from with all of you. And also more generally, we hope that uh, this webinar was useful and interesting. We welcome your feedback uh, on the format, on uh, uh, you know the, the topics, uh, including other topics uh, that uh, you may be interested to hear about. Uh, and we, we hope to organize many more of those to um, allow for this uh, interaction and exchange. So thank you so much uh, to all and look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you very much. And I think that we can now close the webinar. For those uh, who would like to get in touch with UNESCO, with us, with the IOC or with the Liaison Committee. I think our contact information will be shared with you. Yes, it's displayed on the screen. So please do get in touch if you wish to do so. Thank you very much and see you very soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you.